Thank you. It, it's really a great honor to be here. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you walk in the, the door to Trinity College, you see Oscar Wilde and Mary Mo Molly Malone. And it is a reminder to us that uh, uh, there is uh, great thinking and innovative thought all around the world. Uh, as, as w whenever I return to a, a university setting, I, I think back about how I got involved in the world of development. And it began when I uh, went to the Central African Republic at the age of 22. Now, let me guarantee you that the Central African Republic is, if it's not at the ends of the earth, you can at least see the ends of the earth from there. And it is uh, a uh, experience that I'll always remember. I was uh, just left graduate school, and uh, I was sent to Bangui with Pigeon French, uh, and I was asked to put together a development project. Uh, I was given two million dollars uh, to try to help develop uh, the rural health systems in the province of Wam. Uh, so uh, I had the novel idea that I would actually go out to the province of Guam and, and see what was going on before we put the project together. Uh, so I went out and met with government officials and met with uh, the military and asked, you know, what are your health needs in this environment? And I was told by those officials, uh, you know, health really isn't our top priority here. Our top priority is an office building with air conditioning for government officials. And I thought, maybe that's not exactly right. And so uh, I went out with my Peace Corps volunteers to see uh, women in the marketplace. And I asked them what the, what the health problems were. And they were much more explicit. They said, schistosomiasis is killing our children. Infant and maternal mortality is rampant. Every person in this village, in this community, has malaria on a chronic basis. Uh, we have malnutrition, we have diarrhea. Uh, and they didn't just come up with the problems, they came up with the solutions. They said, we need health huts that will provide basic services throughout the communities. We need uh, birth attendants to come in and to monitor uh, any time uh, a mother is giving birth. We need basic feeding programs. We need water programs to, to, to make the water uh, uh, clear of contaminants as well as clear of schistosomiasis. They knew that we were not going to build a big fancy hospital there but they also knew what we could do. And in fact, we took their cue. And so over the course of the next two years, we did put together emergency feeding programs for children and for mothers who were pregnant or lactating. We supported uh, basic financial incentives for community health workers. We uh, built and we stocked village health huts. We drilled boreholes to produce water uh, that was clean. And in fact, we monitored all of these programs to make sure that they were actually uh, achieving the results that we were looking for. By the time I left the Central African Republic two and a half years later, we could already see significant declines in child and maternal mortality. And knowing that I had contributed to the health of a community, knowing that there were kids who were not only surviving but thriving, in part because of my efforts, I was hooked. I was hooked on USAID as an agency. I was hooked on the role of women in development. And most of all, I was hooked on the whole development field. And let me say, over the course of the last 30 years, there has been uh, a lot to keep me hooked. We have actually achieved far more over the last 30 years than at any point in world history in the development space. Indeed, I believe that since the end of the Cold War in 1990, we've seen more progress in global development than at any other period in world history. We've seen real incomes rise by 60% in the developing world. We've seen infant mortality rates plunge by a third. 
We have primary school enrollment rising by 15 percent. We've actually moved 600 million people across the poverty line, which we define as $1.25 uh, per day. We've also seen democracy just flourish. Back at the time when I first began to work on development issues, we had two <coughs> democracies in Africa who were our development partner. Today we have more than two dozen. Never before have so many of our partners been democratic. But if we think about all the progress we've achieved, we have to recognize that we have daunting progress and daunting challenges that we're looking for in the future. We still face a world that's filled with disease and illiteracy, unemployment and corruption, bad governance, food insecurity, uh, and we're now facing a new challenge, which is climate change. And so we have to recognize that we have major uh, difficulties as we move ahead. But at the same time, we also need to recognize how much the world has changed. And I want to refer to a few of those changes. We are unfortunately now in a period where our assistance budgets are tighter than ever before. Here in uh, Ireland, during the uh, middle of this very difficult financial period that you're going through, you've actually seen development assistance decline fairly significantly from about 0.6% to 0.51% of, of GDP. And that is compared to uh, a goal of 0.7% uh, that you're trying to achieve. And so what we're all focused on in this period of declining resources is the importance of contributing to uh, countries themselves who are going to take on their own challenges of development. We have to encourage countries like South Korea and Brazil and India, uh, countries that have moved ahead beyond uh, the need for external development. These countries at the same time are insisting that they have sustainable processes of development. So it's not just about ensuring high growth rates for the short term. It is about creating the sustainable nature of development as we move ahead. The other thing that's very important is that development assistance per se is simply not as key as it used to be. If you think about it, the United States is pr currently providing the largest amount of development assistance that any country has ever provided in world history. It's about $30 billion a year. Well, if you think of, about it in broader terms, uh, the American people, through private charities, through their religious institutions, through non-governmental organizations, provide $39 billion worth of development assistance. So they actually provide more money through their own charitable giving than they do through governments. By contrast, we have $100 billion worth of remittances that are sent by people in the United States to people in developing countries. And each year we have a trillion dollars globally of investment that goes into developing countries. So if you're thinking about the 30 billion that we're providing versus, a, versus 1 trillion of development uh, financial capital and investment, you have to recognize that we need a different role for development assistance. We need to be using our assistance as catalysts, as building of partnerships, as reducing risk for private sector investment. Third, we're in an age of empowerment, uh, reflecting what I like to call the democratization of development. Governments and civil societies in developing countries simply will not accept policies and programs that are made in Washington or Brussels or Dublin or Beijing. They are demanding ownership over their own development drives. And frankly, with the rise of democracy and civil society throughout the developing world, we're, we're much more comfortable with this ownership by local voices, as long as it expresses the aspirations of the local population. 
Fourth, we're, we're coming to the point where we now have a growing consensus on how to do development. Uh, we now understand that uh, all of the uh, lessons that we've picked up from the past can be drawn together. And one very important uh, uh, conference that was held in Busan brought together a consensus where we as an international community put on the table what we're doing, how we're doing it. We recognized that we needed tough monitoring mechanisms to keep ourselves responsible. We needed transparency. We needed to untie assistance. We needed to bring new donors into the process. Uh, we now have China and India that are major financial donors as opposed to recipients. We also have a situation where the developing world has come together uh, to recognize that state fragility is an important impediment to development. We have the Millennium Development Goals, but not a single one of those has been met in a fragile state around the world. And so we have to reaffirm our commitment to reducing risk and building resiliency. And finally, and, and perhaps most importantly for me, there's a new focus on inclusive development. Uh, and by inclusive development, I mean that we need to bring in marginalized populations, including women, including people with disabilities, the LGBT community, indigenous populations, people who are displaced from their homes. If you think about the Arab Spring, it did not occur in, because of low growth rates. In Egypt, Tunisia, all of the countries that have gone through this transformation were achieving 6 and 8 and 10 percent growth rates. But that growth was not being translated into human security. It wasn't creating jobs. It wasn't creating housing and health care and education. It was badly distributed. And so it's not enough to have high economic growth. In particular, we need the aspirations and the vision of the marginalized groups that I was referring to before as part of this process. We have a, an expression we use at USAID, nothing about them without them. And what that is is a recognition that women and LGBT people and people with disabilities have to be planners, implementers, as well as beneficiaries of the programs that we're doing. So we come together at this point, 2013, we have two years left under the Millennium Development Goals ahead, and we are looking at what we are going to replace these goals with. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here, because the European Union is putting together its plans for what will replace the Millennium Development Goals. And I had the privilege last night to address all 27 ministers from the European Union, and I made a relatively audacious uh, statement, which is that in uh, a generation, we now have the power to eliminate extreme poverty around the world, and we should commit ourselves as an international community to do so. If you don't think that's possible, think again. We have, as I've said, moved 500 to 600 million people across the poverty line in recent years. We've achieved tremendous success in terms of child survival. We now have fewer than 7 million children dying each year from preventable diseases. Absolutely way too much, but it is the lowest level in recorded history. And we are achieving great results in that space. The beauty of that single challenge of eliminating extreme poverty is that it brings together all of the different elements associated with development. It brings together food security and hunger and malnutrition. It brings together good governance and anti-corruption, women's empowerment, state fragility, uh, conflict resolution, climate change. Uh, the other thing that's very important about that is that it, is, it has the capacity to inspire us as a global community. It can bring into the process 
the entire set of actors that we need right now. And again, perhaps most importantly, it can bring in the private sector as well. So we look at our programs for food security around the world. We now have some 70 international corporations who are providing more than three and a half billion dollars worth of investment in agriculture in Africa in order to build food security. We brought together 160 countries last year to pledge that within a generation we will eliminate uh, preventable child death around the world and we have 120 corporations and civil society actors who are involved with that. Perhaps the, the one partnership that's most inspiring to me is one that we put together at the Rio Plus 20 conference last year. We got together with the Consumer Goods Forum, which represents 450 companies around the world, the Coca-Cola, the Colgate, Colgate Palm Olives, and the Unilevers. And we said, if we agree to have you come and announce this at the White House, would you be willing to pledge to eliminate net deforestation from your supply chains within a decade? And they went even further. They said as a group that they would do it by 2020. And so the, please understand what this means, that uh, companies that are currently uh, cutting down forests in order to uh, produce beef and produce soybeans and, and, uh, and palm oil and pulp and paper have committed globally that by 2020 they will have net deforestation of zero. And we brought them to the White House to announce that. And I've always said that the White House is the single biggest home court advantage in the world. And they, uh, they were very proud to do so. If we are to achieve this goal of eliminating poverty, extreme poverty within a generation, let me assure you that it's your generation that's going to do this. We are currently in a period in the United States where we are seeing the single greatest growth in commitment to development on college campuses in our history. We now have more students who are, have either as their principal major or their minor development studies than any other discipline in the social sciences. We also have a remarkable process of bringing in the technology that young people are so comfortable with into the development field. I came back into government about three years ago and I spoke French and Portuguese and Malay and a bit of English, but I had to learn a new language and that was the language of technology. Because the day that I got there, people were talking about data paloozas and people were talking about crowdsourcing and people were talking about hackathons. You know, I used to think hackers were bad people, and now we're dealing with a group that calls itself Random Hacks of Kindness. Uh, and as we look at what is going on in college campuses in the United States, it is truly amazing. I want to give you four examples. In my uh, 35 years of government service, I've served mostly in developing countries, mostly in Africa, and I've had the privilege of having malaria eight times. <laughs> malaria is the single most debilitating disease you can imagine. And the worst part about malaria is the time between when you think you've contracted the disease and when you get the blood test that says, yes, you, you have the disease. Because you don't want to take the curative dose too early. It's got terrible effects on your body. But at the same time, you know that you need it. And it usually has taken two, three days to do that. And if you've got cerebral malaria, you'll die in the interim. So a group of college kids around the United States were saying, this is ridiculous. You know, we have 6.5 billion cell phones in the world. We can figure out a way to get the resolution on cell phones good enough so that if you take a picture of a blood smear and you send it to a laboratory, you can find out within 15 minutes whether you've got malaria or not. 
and they, instead of playing computer games for a month, they committed to try to come up with the lens that would work and all the applications. And within a month, they did it. And they have now given their, uh, their technology to the U.S. government, and we're trying to make it work. It's still too expensive to do it writ large through every cell phone. But what we're looking at is sending out lenses that have high enough resolution and then applications for cell phones that will allow us to do this. I am certain that we will save literally hundreds of thousands of lives because of their efforts. A second thing that's going on, and again using cell phones, a group of students at University of Denver uh, linked up with students from around the country have said, we need to attack the global challenge of trafficking in persons. And the way we can do this from our own communities is to refuse to buy products that have been produced with trafficked labor. And so what they are doing, first of all, they developed a, an application where you can take your cell phone into a store and put it up against the barcode of products and tell how much trafficked labor was involved in producing that product. Now they are in the process of trying to uh, populate the data so that this will apply to all products. And so eventually what is going to happen is you will have the capacity when you're buying uh, tennis shoes to put your cell phone up against the various products and say, I'm not going to buy this product because they do traffic. I'm not going to, I am going to buy that product. And you can bet that's going to have an impact on the behavior of these companies. Once we do it with trafficked labor, we can do it with conflict minerals, we can do it with child labor, we can do it with anything. And it is going to mobilize popular activity in this space. A third uh, challenge that uh, students in the United States took on was the question of arsenic in drinking water. If you think that sounds obscure, all throughout the developing world, the fact that there is arsenic in the drinking water that young children drink causes stunting, causes mental deficiencies, it causes deaths all around the world. And the way this actually occurred, as I understand it, is a student from Bangladesh was with his colleagues and there was a glass of water on the table and he declined to drink from it. And his friend said, why aren't you drinking from this? And he said, you don't understand, in my country you don't just drink water because it could have this impact of arsenic. And these kids then sat around trying to figure out how could you produce a product that would eliminate the, the arsenic. And they realized that arsenic chemically uh, compounds with lead. And so if you could figure out how to put a lead filter of kinds in uh, water pots around the world, you could address the challenge. And they figured out a way to do it cheaply, efficiently. They've now given it to us. We're trying to develop this. And again, literally millions of kids around the world are going to see mental deficiencies disappear, going to see stunting disappear because of their efforts. And finally, the one that I, I am most intrigued about, uh, I used to be the advisor to President Clinton for fighting landmines around the world. As you may know, there's some 25 million landmines that have been planted around the world uh, during periods of conflict. I was the U.S. ambassador in Angola during a period where we had a million landmines planted in a single country by 14 separate armies. Who, and you know, the very first thing you did when you created a rebel movement was to put landmines around your, your facilities. We had literally hundreds of thousands of victims of these landmines. And the difficulty is identifying where they are in peacetime. So you come in and you want to demine, but you know, mine detectors are fairly inefficient. Uh, you, you have uh, uh, detecting dogs who use their noses to identify where the landmines are, but nothing has really worked well. So we had a 14-year-old girl in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 
who said, that's ridiculous. I've got to be able to figure out this problem. Now, I will say her parents were professors of, of chemistry and astrophysics, so it wasn't like she was just a normal girl. But she spent the next three years trying to figure it out. And she came up with the solution, which was to, and I, I don't truly understand it, but it's to send two waves of sound into the ground in areas that you suspect and where they hit a thud that's where some uh, object is, and it's a pretty good mapping for, for how to, uh, to find out where the landmine is. Now, I can guarantee you that we spent decades trying to do this. We uh, paid our Defense Department a lot of money to try to replicate the nose of a dog in a laboratory. We tried to train bees to find uh, gunpowder. We created microbes that were fluorescent that you could you know, uh, put in water and put on the ground and they would sink into the ground and identify where the landmine was. None of it worked. The idea that the 17-year-old girl now has is going to work and it's going to save people's limbs all around the world. What I'm trying to suggest here is that the combination of the global will to eliminate extreme poverty and disease combined with the intellectual qualities that we now have can truly achieve uh, important results. And I think it's very important to remember that this is being done on an individual basis. We can talk about great movements, we can talk about great challenges of economic development and growth. But this is going to be done one by one. And I wanted to with one story. Uh, I mentioned one of my first experiences in <clears throat> development. I wanted to mention one very recent experience. Uh, we've been spending a lot of money at USAID to try to eliminate uh, violence against women. Uh, it is one of the truly uh, calamitous uh, uh, phenomena all around the world especially during periods of conflict when social wars break down, uh, violence against women expands, both se sexual and domestic violence. And so we've been putting a lot of resources into this. And I've always felt uh, a little concerned because you never really see the impact. Uh, I've always sort of wondered, are we keeping one woman in the DRC uh, Eastern Congo uh, from being raped, or are we helping one girl in uh, Afghanistan to not have acid thrown in her face for daring to return to school? And so we put a lot of money into Central America in this space, and I recently traveled to Guatemala to look at some of our programs. One of the programs that we're involved with is mobilizing indigenous women to fight domestic violence. And we went out to one of the small villages where uh, their program has been put together. And they were coming together in remarkable ways, putting pressure on their government, putting pressure on their spouses, putting pressure on their village elders to eliminate domestic violence in their community. And they were one by one telling us how much they had achieved. But it really didn't hit home until at the end, one man stood up. And he said, I joined this group about three years ago. When I was a young boy, I saw my mom be beaten by my, my dad. And I could do nothing to stop it. And I felt powerless. I felt emasculated. And so when I grew up, in order to express myself as a man, I started to beat my wife. He said, I joined this group. And about two years ago, my wife gave birth to a young son. And I was holding the son in my arms and looking down. And I said, it stops here. This pattern stops with me. And he said he was going through psychosocial training to move himself beyond domestic violence and that it was working. And so if you ever think to yourself that it can't happen, that one person can't make a change. Think about the people in the college campuses. Think about that young man 
and you realize that you have the power to change the world. So thank you.